And the reason there is, it's not one off. Now, we are in this business to grow it. Our philosophy and genesis is that we need to get our hands dirty. Bottom up, we need to build it stack by stack. And thereby, uh, nobody will have more ownership of the asset than the people who are building it in the rural parts. So they actually have that bhagidari ki mera plant hai. This is my plant built it. You know, I have seen it brick by brick being built. And that's the ownership. Once we have built it, it is there for, for them to run it. We are only doing a management service around it. The farmer is bringing or the VLE is bringing the biomass. The people who have got technically trained there are locals. They are working and running those plants. Another thing what we do, you know, we build all our projects on our own. So right from day one, right from the concept to bringing it to paper, drawing board, engineering, then doing the EPC, the engineering, procurement, construction, the project management consultancy, all of it is done in-house. And the reason there is, it's not one-off. Now we are in this business to grow it. Our philosophy and genesis is that we need to get our hands dirty. Bottom up, we need to build it stack by stack and thereby uh, nobody will have more ownership of the asset than the people who are building it in the rural parts. So they actually have that bhagidari ki mera plant hai. This is my plant built it. You know, I have seen it brick by brick being built and that's the ownership. Once we have built it, it is there for, for them to run it. We are only doing a management service around it. The farmer is bringing or the VLE is bringing the biomass. The people who have got technically trained there are locals. They are working and running those plants. It's just that the ownership is lying in my book sitting in Bombay. So they actually resonate with such assets in, in you know, their geographical area that, hey, this is something which is mine. And that's what is the genesis to actually build, you know, and scale the way we are doing. Now, this is one of the unique projects where we said, and this was our first one, why do we need to densify? If I can use farm agri residue in the form it is, because in densification, I'm not adding anything into it. All I'm doing is densifying it so that I can store and transport. But if within a radius of 40, 50 kilometers, I can use it in the form that it is available, then I'm significantly able to reduce that cost of energy. And this is what we did with our first project. And once we did this, or when, once we went to establish this, actually the boiler manufacturer told us, we will not be able to do it because we have not done it anywhere globally. And being, you know, from a technical bent of mind, I said, what's changing? Why can't we do it? And we pushed ourselves and the boiler manufacturer and they did not give us the requisite guarantee warranties of performance. And with the first project, very difficult to do such kind of a thing. But we stuck our neck out. We said we will do it. And this is operating now more than five years continuously without any problem. So we actually, you know, did groundbreaking on 9th April 2019. We commissioned the plant on 20th March 20. And to all our good luck, 24th March was the nationwide lockdown. And here goes your first project where, you know, everything is pinned hopes upon. But because of the decentralized energy model, because of the biomass being available, in this case, we had already aggregated it in the months of September, October, November. We were able to operate this asset, in fact, at an increased capacity, at a full capacity, all through COVID without a single day of shutdown. And that actually changed a mindset thinking for me personally as well. You know, the fallacy that I run my company or, you know, if I am not there, what will happen? Or if, let's say, ABCD individual is not there, what will happen? Change. Everything happens if you are able to give responsibility if you are able to give the ownership and thus in our model today you know we are as i said across 21 states it's so decentralized but the processes of you know the they are independently run each of our assets yes it gets audited you know there are processes of feedback reporting all of that happens on a daily basis but the ownership resides where it is actually is so this is how we actually construct plants you know, these are large plants, heavy duty equipment also gets involved. Now, this is the flow. So actually from the fuel storage, 
to feeding it to moving fuel, boiler furnaces, you know, control room. Uh, you have to meet the pollution control board norms. Uh, typically, this is between 50 to 30 ppm in terms of the particulate matter that you can send out of your chimney. And it is 24 by 7 direct feed monitored by, you know, the pollution control board department. So these are actually highly efficient, clean, green boilers which are running. Again, use case, you know, we have biomass, we have briquettes. During COVID time, we saw there were, you know, multiple bodies being being cremated or, you know, was done on single cremation piles. Wood was not available. It, they were horror stories, you know, India Today carried the cover where it was a horror story of, of not being able to provide cremation to the dead. And I said, you know, as a society, where are we and what are we doing? And that's where we said we have briquettes available. We burn these in boilers. Why can't we do cremation based on briquettes? And we offered these briquettes to Pune Municipal Corporation and Aurangabad Municipal Corporation. They did accept it. And it was sent to them in few trucks and we received permissions. But they could not use it effectively because in India, and that's where you know I also learned and we started learning, the cremation pits are open pit. And so they could not place these briquettes. So, you know, in some format, whatever it was used. And that's where we said it's simple. So we, we today, the photograph that you see, these are cremation pyres which we invest in and we put across crematoriums across India. And you look at the list of cities and this is growing very fast. There are maybe you know, three times more this number today. And then we replace wood from Hindu cremation. Now the sentiment of the societal you know, sentiment is Agni Moksha. They want the cremation to be done by burning. There are alternatives, you know, you have electric crematoriums, you have gas crematoriums. But if you look at data, all of it or most of it is continuing to happen and this is upwards of 90% in terms of numbers is happening on wood. And then we questioned, we said, how is this wood sourced? So the wood is sourced by the urban local bodies, the municipal corporations by way of tenders. And there are wood vendors who participate in this tenders and they get, you know, the tender. And what is the tender? The tender is that per cremation, the wood has to be provided by a wood vendor at 4,000 or 4,500 rupees per cremation. And typically for a cremation, when you go to a you get wood and you get kgs of wood, that's the model. To our shock, there is a value of tree or value of the tree in India is 74,500 rupees per year into the life or estimated life of that tree. So that means for each Hindu cremation, typically we down 10 years of tree life which is 7.5 lakh rupees of a national asset at 4,000 or 4,500 rupees. Why? It's your and mine asset. It's a national asset. At the price point of what working has been done by Honorable Supreme Court through various committees and there's an order over there. But through urban local bodies, we still continue to do cremation at 4,000 or 4,500 rupees burning 7.5 lakh rupees of national asset. And we question this and there are no answers. But in terms of the answers, what we do today, we build such cremation pyres through tenders and then supply these briquettes to these crematoriums to replace wood. And a use case of Aurangabad, if you see the data which is there, we started putting out data from November 2022. But you know, we started from zero actually. And at April 24, 93% of the entire Hindu cremation in Aurangabad is on biomass briquettes we have moved away and replaced wood. And today this number is consistently above 92, 93% month on month. So what have we achieved? A full societal change. And nobody has been forced. Even today, if somebody wants to go into a cremation ground and some family says, you know, cremation to be done on wood, unfortunately the wood is replaced, but otherwise the option is there with the family. So why I'm bringing this case is, now look at the commercial side of it. When I sell briquettes to a boiler or when I use it in the boiler is in the range of eight to nine rupees per kg. But in a D2C segment where it is going for cremation because it is further bagged, you know, stored multiple locations, you are delivering it. And, and this data is for 38 cremation grounds in Aurangabad. This is not one cremation ground. 
every cremation pile. You realize between 10 to 12 rupees. Now, the municipal corporation, which was paying 4,000 to 500 rupees per cremation, because this is more densified, this is more, you know, in a shape and form, uh, in a cage, you know, better oxygen flow, etc., is actually paying 3,000 rupees per cremation. A 40% reduction in the outgo from the municipal corporation. And now look at the carbon sink. Two trees saved per cremation. As on date, we have done about 7,500 plus cremation. Look at the data of the number of trees which have been saved. So this is something again which we have taken as a mandate. And now these tenders are ha happening across India. And as a use case, you are using this farm agri residue for Hindu cremation. And you look at the government scheme. A mark and arm paid, you know, one crore trees planted in a day, etc., etc. And look at our data where with every creme Hindu cremation, we cut down two trees. Unsustainable. So changes need to be brought in a systematic manner. And there are cases, you know, we are showing cases as now similarly, you know, these are products which we have developed, and this is the RD side of our business, where these are ergonomic eco chulas which have been developed, which use this farm agri residue. And we replace LPG, better heat intensity. We are 35 to 40 percent cheaper than diesel LPG. We are cleaner because we are carbon neutral and these are still fossil fuels for LPG and diesel. And this is what now is getting promulgated as a product. Okay, where are we going or heading towards? So all that I spoke till now was using the thermal value. But now where we are moving is the biofuels or bioenergy where we are going to use the carbon molecule value. And this is where now technology engineering comes into play, where you can use this captured carbon for molecular chemistry. And once you are started playing with the carbon, uh, you know, atom or molecule, then it's a complete shift. So you will replace all that you do with the crude stream, all that you do with the petrochemical stream with the biomass and biochemical stream. So setting up biorefineries today, you can actually replace fossil fuel, your petrol, diesel, aviation fuel in the same specifications. There is no change in specifications with fuel streams coming from that photosynthesis carbon. And look at the amount of your energy that is going to flow from the farm agriculture residue stream. Yes, there is going to be, you know, there are the large lobbies of crude coal globally who will not want this to happen immediately but that's the kind of shift which is happening or that's the kind of force this new energy is bringing where these large global majors have now started looking at this form of energy so 2g ethanol 3g ethanol compressed biogas replacement for cng i have given you a use case replacement of fuel green hydrogen from biomass biochemicals biofertilizers sustainable aviation fuel combined heat and power plants biochar which is one of the most carbon sequester sinks uh, you know again it's a technological intervention which is happening and all of this is happening in india and globally and hence you not only have the burn value or the thermal value but now we are moving to the molecular value of this carbon and what's going to be the mainstay supply chain management because each of this will need sustainable supply chain management to be built up. Now, carbon credits. You have carbon credits and, you know, for our projects and all of these. So, you know, it's a simple process. Not just a time-consuming process of registration and development, but yes, it can be done and it should be done. Briefly, you know, CBI was mentioned. This is the industry body called as Confederation of Biomass Energy Industry of India. I am the founder chairman here. I was guided by a few members of India that you know wind solar etc they have large associations and you know large bodies and lobbies which work you should have something on the biomass bioenergy side as well and that's where we form this do visit the website you will see the who's who names that we have been able to bring to this segment and you know the, the policy advocacy regulatory framework all such work including for farmers FPOs etc is all done by this organization now this is decentralized renewable energy. It can be set up anywhere because everywhere we have farm agri residue. I have spoken briefly about the environment and health benefits. These are actually documented numbers. Uh, one kg of biomass uses vis a vis one kg of CNG, LNG, crude. What's the carbon offset? These numbers are there. You know, again, it empowers farmers with additional income 
it promotes entrepreneurship financial inclusion we work only through the banking channel and hence wherever we are there is a financial inclusion which happens and there are equal opportunities for for women across our offices gopichand would you like to unmute your and ask your first question so my uh, firstly to thank you it's, it was a really great presentation you have put a lot of data i think uh, this is my first presentation me seeing someone presenting very clearly and you know really thank you for the information so my question is i, I was just trying to understand you know at the end of the day everything is by i mean everything is a corporate stuff so even if we combust i mean i come from an agriculture background so i i understand you know that's burning it's quite common i i come from telangana so it's it's quite common to burn all the agri waste but i'm still trying to understand even if we burn it you know for the power generation steam and boiler there are still some tail pipe emissions or you know scope 3 emissions or something like that uh, are there any plans that you know to convert this into biogas generation biogas to some sort of bio hydrogen something like that and what is the cost associated through pyrolysis or something like that? sure thank you so you are right in your first statement that a burning is going to cost emission your the question is you are burning and replacing for the same energy vis-a-vis a fossil fuel so coal lng lpg ldo furnace oil and these are highly polluting sulfur rich fuels which you are replacing with only the carbon component so if you look at uh, what, what's actually polluting the sox and nox so when you're burning biomass it's only a pure carbon play you are actually devoid of the sox and nox because it's not available even in traces in that biomass so that's one part second any carbon methodology that you look at uh, there are two processes one is abatement and replacement so in the burning factor it is about abatement and replacement what you are also talking about you know if if you can do uh, let's say compressed biogas or you can do pyrolysis for syn gas and then use that carbon chemistry and that's what exactly i talked about towards the end of my presentation that today the higher value is coming from or going to come from the carbon chemistry and that's where the technology players come burning is the simple part and that's a replacement value and you know you know get carbon credits also it is cheaper than fossil fuel because it is highly decentralized and you are able to do it and that's what has taken off but in the world and you know within india as well we are now shifting to the carbon chemistry so yes that is where you know the focus is and in that in terms of price points and values or iras these are commercial models which are very new and typically when they are new all three elements of upstream midstream and downstream are market making which has to happen and these point price points are actually not making sense today but with the scale coming in you know the economies of scale newer technologies coming in like you take the solar example we started at 18 20 rupees and we came to 2 rupee 44 paisa what changed nothing much in terms of technology improvement scale of manufacturing so all of it is going to happen in the biofuel side also be rest assured the initial phase could be price competitiveness to come in but with scale coming it will actually go down the second part and i'll you know briefly touch upon the energy roi to move crude or the present forms of energy that we use the and this is a global number which is available you should google and read about it the the energy roi used to be 1 is to 6 which meant one barrel of crude equivalent was spent for six barrels of crude equivalent of energy to reach us for use putting in my car or getting lpg in my house that was a global number this has shifted to 2 is to 5 which means we are spending more energy for a lower amount of energy to come to us for consumption and this is likely to go to 2.5 to 4.5 because the oil wells have gone deeper the coal is go- we are going deeper to get the coal out and when you look at the energy we are expending to get energy and you compare it to the decentralized 50 km hub and spoke model of biomass energy even on the energy roi matrix itself you are significantly high on energy efficiency so these are all statistical tool and numbers which are now known coming into the gambit and you are not only going to evaluate what i'm going to burn is what energy but you also going to evaluate because you mentioned scope 2 scope 3 what is it actually in the energy life that it is costing me and and that's that's you know mind boggling in terms of numbers so it's actually statistical energy science which is now started coming into play to do this so yes 
we will shift to biofuels we will shift to molecular chemistry that's where we are going towards with bioenergy and that's the 75% of the energy basket so our next question is from vishwanath raman paddy straw fire catches fires when the ambient heat increases how do you control the situation to avoid fire in the storage yards or collection centers he's right uh, these are called as auto methane fires you know any biodegradable material when you are going to have methane emission degradation happening and at certain temperatures certain conditions of moisture auto fires happen we have also gone through this and anybody who uses any type of biomass has to you know live through this journey to mitigate it actually uh, during such time periods you need to make that biomass moist we actually put water you know you actually use point you wanted to be the lowest in terms of moisture content but in storage we actually use water to keep it moist so that you can mitigate such methane and prevent such fires at those temperature points so it's a it's a it's a hazard it's a problem and that's where i said in terms of storage better storage warehousing better processes to come in and that needs capital allocation that needs capital so with the advancement happening such capital allocations are also coming government has stepped up you know the such biomass storage today you can do warehousing in rural india and you can dip into the agriculture infrastructure fund which is 1 lakh 10000 crores for infrastructure development and building even for paddy straw or any other farm agri residue so a lot of schemes and subsidies are available it's about the knowledge to get to know about it and dip into it but it can be done so i just wanted to understand uh, let us say we have like these villages in punjab which are mostly growing rice paddy now if you were to set up a plant per village so a village with about 1000 acres of paddy what sort of plant would be required and what is the capex involved so sir uh, typically per acre of land you would get 3 tons of rice paddy straw yield this is the variety which is rampantly you know grown across punjab haryana now if you set 1000 acres you have about into 3 you know so that's the rice paddy straw which is available a commercial scale plant so so i i have a 100% rice straw bricketing plant sir a typical size there would be 50 tons of big tons of output per day and that would entail about another 20% more of biomass required because it comes at a higher moisture and you reduce it and, and you know bring it out so for a 100 ton per day output i need about 120 tons per day of input into 300 days of operation so that's the number sir so i need about 40000 tons of rice paddy straw now you look at the number which you put forward sir of a 1000 acres into 3 So you're getting three thousand tons of rice paddy straw, whereas a plant which I'm talking about hundred tons per day output requires forty thousand tons of rice paddy straw. So typically, I will need ten such villages for one project to come up. Yes, Dilip Mish Kumar, please ask your question. Yeah, myself from Jindal Steel and Power. My question is: the use of a biochar is a form of biocoke in our steel industries. Is there any research or any setup you are having in India, sir? Ah, uh, Dilip Kumar ji, the answer is yes. uh biochar india as i said we have formed uh the company is already formed we are also in engagement with your organization and multiple more steel companies tata steel amns jsw etc everybody for this biochar requirement uh we are fully understand the specifications which are needed by the steel industry for the pci coal replacement uh and the answer is yes it can be done 